I'm gonna beat you into the living death. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Walkout Network. It's your man, Ant Walker, here with the latest edition of the Living Death Show. Um, before I begin, man, I missed you guys. I've, it's been a, a crazy couple of weeks in my personal life, but I am back and ready to talk about some action with two of my favorite people. So let's go ahead and introduce them, despite the fact they need no introduction. First up is the jack of all trades who has mastered them all, the senior editor of Sherdog.com, and my man, Ben Duffy. What's up, Ben? Hey, I'm doing really well. It was a packed week of mixed martial arts behind us. There is another packed week ahead of us. So, I mean, I'm ready to dive right in. Absolutely. And of course, every week the panel is anchored by the man with the stats, the facts, the figures, and the numbers. He is the associate editor of Sherdog.com. Also, my good friend, Mr. Jay Petrie. What's up, Jay? Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot on our plates, and there's going to be a lot more coming down the pipe. Uh, it, we're right smack in the middle of that big April rush and uh, it's too bad we don't get to eat any crow about it, but that's okay because I'm sure I'd look bad doing so. Um, but the stat of the week is a, it's an oddball thing that happened from the UFC card, UFC on ESPN 34. Uh, throughout the course of the night, uh, 14 fights, there were for the first time in UFC history. So the stat of the week is one. There were every possible kind of judges decision. On, in, in play, I mean, not, not counting draws, of course. There was a unanimous decision, there was a split decision, there was a majority decision, and there was a technical decision. That has never happened before. Um, there were two technical decisions, and, and I hope we get to talk about those. Uh, so, yeah, so this was a real oddball fight card. So that's my side of the week. All right, sounds good. So before we go any further, remember to like, subscribe, share, tell a friend to tell a friend, tell that friend to tell 10 more friends. All right, gentlemen, so first order of business. We had a main event uh, at the UFC Apex Center the other night featuring Bilal Muhammad in a uh, decision win over Vicente Luque. Big big name. Um, this is, I mean, arguably his best quality win for Muhammad, um, depending on what you think of Wonder Boy in this current iteration of him. Do you think this win means that Bilal Muhammad is ready for the absolute top of the division? Yes. He's barely a year removed from the highest profile fight of his career. It was the Leon Edwards fight. That had all the look of a welterweight title eliminator, especially for Edwards. You know, uh, Muhammad was stepping in uh, on short notice there. But it ended in failure that didn't really help anybody's case. And all Muhammad has done since then is rattle off three more wins against top 10 fighters. He beat Damian Maya, uh, who, look, Maya was a top 10 quality fighter at the time beat Wonder Boy, has now beat Luke. In all three cases, he made it look somewhere between easy and straightforward. He's ready. Like, there's there was a lot of squawking in the wake of the event just because it wasn't the prettiest win. It was a grindy win. It was what Bilal Muhammad has become. You know, he presented in the UFC as a bit of an action fighter, kind of fit into that Luke Nico Price type mold, and he's become just much more methodical and airtight. He's a guy that doesn't make mistakes, doesn't give away fights. Like, it's not pretty, but he's now unbeaten in eight straight fights. Yeah, he's becoming undeniable. It, it's, it's good for him that he is in this position uh, because, uh, because of his style that he presents. Not a lot of people are going to line up to watch him go, knowing, oh, well, we know what's going to happen. I mean, the guy has a finish rate below 25%. That as, as a top flight welterweight, even even counting in the wins on the regional circuit, the Hoosier Fight Clubs and the you know mid mid tier Titan FCs, it's it's not very high. Um, he knows exactly what he is, and he's good at it, and he is consistently good at that he's he has this really impressive ability to to put the fight where he wants it without like duffy said making the mistakes to get there uh, like i i expected vincente luque would would win this fight i thought he would win the fight i didn't think it was going to be a, like a 70 second finish like before but i thought over time uh you know luque has just just bricks in his fists and, and and there would just be that one time where where Muhammad would get stung and he'd shoot for a takedown, leave his neck exposed, that kind of thing. 
Well, that never really presented itself over five rounds. And that, I think, makes it more impressive to me that Luque had five rounds to do what he does because he's just the epitome. You know, he's the king of the action fighters. He's the guy that will will snatch a darts out of nowhere or he'll rock you and just put you away in a, a crazy flurry. And uh, for Muhammad to just kind of push through him, I think made made that real statement that you can't go but but Maya, 40 years old, but Stephen Thompson, not the Stephen Thompson of young. Luke Hay is not the, the uh, you know, aging whatever. He's 30. He's in his prime. And you saw what he did to Kiesa. You saw what he did to Woodley. You saw what he did to Randy Brown. You saw he broke Nico Price's face. So, yeah, Bah Baham Muhammad is ready for spotlight. I just hope that fans can be too. Yeah, that that was um, definitely leading into the the next thing I, I want to ask. Um, like you said, Ben, this was not the the fan friendly fight necessarily. This wasn't the the action fight that you know that we kind of expected from Bilal Muhammad early in his UFC run. Um, do you think that the type of win is going to hurt his case for being one of those top title contenders? No, I mean look at look at the top two guys in the division. You have two grindy wrestlers who are kind of lording over this division. And for the longest time, I mean, Kamaro Snoozman is, is it's not the most clever pun ever, but for most of his way up, it was extremely appropriate. It's kind of ironic that Covington only started calling him that after he started knocking people out. Uh, <clears throat> and then Covington himself. The, the division is currently lorded over by two wrestlers who ground their way to the top, and one of whom has never really been much of a finisher, one who really only developed that once he got with uh, Trevor Whitman and retooled his striking. There's room for Muhammad up there. I'm interested to see what happens when he runs into one of those guys. But he either needs to do the Usman thing, which is just keep doing you and yelling out, I'm a problem, nobody fucking wants to fight me after every one of your wins, or go the Covington route and just start talking mad shit while fighting exactly the same as you always have. That, you know, that's pretty much it. Well, what's, what do you think is the next step for Muhammad? Who, who do you think he should be facing next? Gilbert Burns. He called out Covington. I, I like that matchup in that it would let me know what it looks like when Muhammad fights a better wrestler than himself. But it leaves the problem that if Covington wins, then all the momentum from Muhammad's, uh, uh, unbeaten streak is gone. He's out of the immediate title picture and it doesn't make a third Covington Usman fight any more appealing. I like the Burns fight because while Burns has also lost to Usman, he's only lost to him once and he actually had Usman in a world of trouble in the first round. If, if uh, Burns after, you know, giving Hamzat Shemaev the fight of his life and then beating Bilal Muhammad, a, a rematch with Usman is more sellable than anything that could come out of a Covington win. And then, of course, if, if Muhammad beats uh, Burns, Muhammad then has, you know, f what, four straight wins over top 10 fighters progressing into the top five, and he becomes even more undeniable. And that can happen while Usman is getting his business settled with Edwards and then possibly uh, Shemaev. It's so incredibly, excruciatingly telling how the UFC markets certain and pushes certain fighters. Shamayev leapfrogged from Li Jing Liang to Gilbert Burns. And now we're legitimately, and I agree, Duffy, I'm not dumping on your pick, think that Burns is a good test for Muhammad, who has not lost in eight fights, beating Luque, Thompson, Maya, Diego Lima, Lyman Good, Takashi Sato, and Curtis Curtis Millinder. So Muhammad wins or doesn't lose in eight fights to get a crack at Burns and Shemaev smashes his way up there to do it. Now, obviously, a lot of it is the different fighting styles. And well, the way you just said smashes his way. Exactly. Presenting. But at the same time, Muhammad hasn't lost much other than the first round of, of the Edwards fight. I don't think he lost more than a round. He lost like a round or two against Luke hey, Um And there's, maybe a there's round. There's a reason his nickname is Remember the Name. Yeah. Because you got to see him do this shit a couple times before yeah. it starts to stay. Because people have to, to remember yeah. <laughs> that you're doing it. And it's it's so wild to see that. 
which is why I want that fight to happen. Burns uh, or Shamaya uh, Muhammad, and won't happen. Won't happen in a million years. He fought Burns, so Shamaya was up above him. Shamaya's not going to fight down. That's not the thing. But there's something that I I, I noticed as we were looking through this the, the division, and I'm going to do a really terrible thing. This might be the worst division on the roster from an entertainment perspective. Look at the top ten and the styles they present. Usman, besides his recent couple knockouts, super grinder. Covington, super grinder. Edwards, what? Oh, oh. Uh, Muhammad, Wonder Boy is a kind of a point fighter. Uh, Sean Brady can get struggled in, in to get his submission grappling going. Neil Magny, it's a tough division. Now, it is a spectacularly competitive division, but from an entertainment perspective, oof. I, this isn't new. I mean, the Robbie Lawler era was a little blip in an otherwise yeah. very mm -hmm. dull division at the top. Yeah. We're talking about Johnny you know, Hendricks. I mean, it was exciting to see whether he'd make weight, but, uh, you yeah. know, we had George St. Pierre, one of the most famously watched the paint dry champions of all time in terms of the in cage product. You know, Hughes, who was really most spectacular in his losses. Yeah. Like, the, the I mean, big, it's always it's always been a dull division at the top. You what think about that? George St. Pierre versus Jake Shields being the big, big fight that it was. And, K1 Shields, as we keep yeah, born. Yeah, and you think about what, you know, what the those two uh, gentlemen have looked like time time in, time out, and the level of, of just grinding decisions that, that they both have cranked out. Like, you know, that that's kind of what welterweight has been for as long as I can remember, at least. No. Other than like archetypes and body types and those all those different scientific terms, why? Why is this? Because 167, I know, is a good, solid wrestling division, but it just seems this it it historically, I mean, you're right, has been the wrestlers wrestlers division. I mean, look at I, look at middleweight. You have what? Who's your who's your big wrestler? Bronson, I guess. I mean, Gastelum, <laughs> sort of. Marvin Vittori is probably in the top three. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would I would say it's probably because, I mean, we are talking about a larger segment of the population, which means that the this is going to be like the athletical, uh, the athletic equalizers. Like I can see that. When you, when you just put skill versus skill in and of itself, you know, UFC 1 showed the superiority of grappling. Um, so so I think I, th I think this is just a, a larger picture uh, that's, that's telling us the same thing. I mean, we do we do know, to answer my own question, we do know that welterweight is one of the most popular divisions besides lightweight. So right. there's just simply more of them, which means that they can, you know, the cream can rise to the top. I, I don't want to sidetrack ourselves for that. Uh -huh. I just I just picked up on that and went, my gosh, the top 10, it's just littered with 50-45 fighters. And I, I think it's just chance because uh featherweight is pretty much devoid of lockdown wrestlers at the top exactly. but 141 and 149 are both great mm -hmm. divisions in amateur wrestling yeah oh, good points there all right fellas well we did also uh saturday night we had two technical decisions um i, I mean how did you think those were handled what did you agree with one disagree with the other terribly think both were good terribly they were handled Speak terribly piece, man. No. they were they, they were botched both of those were botched they both should have been disqualifications. I I mean, talking first about the uh, Budai versus Barnett one, maybe my definition of inadvertent or accidental is different from Dan Mergliata's. You know, I love mixed martial arts. I love combat sports, but words are my actual lifeline. I've been a writer and copy editor for much, much longer than I've been working in this space. And by any definition that I can think of, inadvertent and accidental does not apply to uh, the fight ending foul there. It wasn't one of these high speed collision things where there's there's a lot of moving parts and just a finger got into an eye or, you know, a foot wandered up to the cup or, or something. He was mashing Barnett in the fence, like literally holding him in place and spiked him on the back of the head with his elbow. Like it was as blatant as you could as you could make it like it was something like a wrestling heel would do it was completely intentional and if it was intentional 
it was illegal and it was fighting. That's a fucking disqualification. Like what, what could possibly be more clear than that? If it, it shouldn't matter that he was winning the fight up to that point. If you do, if you're winning the fight, doing one stupid thing can get you knocked out. It can get you submitted and it should be able to get you disqualified. Like th there's no reason that should have gone to a technical decision. It was a flagrant illegal action and it, it yeah, it should have been a disqualification. In the Bohayo versus Omar Gajia fight, it's even worse because it's something that he'd already been warned for and a point had been taken away for. If a foul is worth taking away a point for and it ended the fight, how is that not a disqualification? If you've taken away a point, you, you're already implying that it was either intentional or it was negligent to the point where it makes no difference whether it was intentional or not. If you're at that point and the foul ended the fight, how is that not a disqualification? And again, it doesn't matter that Bahalia was dominating that fight and he was about 60 seconds away from really a breakout debut in the UFC. Just ask John Jones. You can be dominating a fight and doing one stupid fucking thing, by all rights, should be able to, to lose you that fight. Like, yeah, these were both completely botched. Bad night at the office for Dan Merglia. Um, I'll say in defense of... Um... Of, of the Bahario fight, like it, more so um, an indictment of the rule set. Like this is, this is one of those times where it matters what, you know, what imaginary line you've crossed, you know, in, in the United States to determine whether or not that was legal or illegal. Uh, and, and that, I mean, and, and we'll, you know, without jumping into the debate of how silly the grounded uh, opponent rule can be at times. I mean, this was clearly against the spirit of that rule. Like if you are in that position against the fence and your hand is down, you're no more likely to be con concussed than if your hand is up. Um, you're you're in no extra danger uh, in 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 that position with with a finger touching the ground or not. So, um, but still, illegal is illegal. Illegal strikes should be disqualifying events uh, if they end the fight. I mean, it's the rule. Like at at some point we have to have a crowd. I mean, we have to have a lot of questions. We have to have a lot of conversations uh, about consistency. Why was that? And why was that a technical decision when Aljo Sterling Peter Yams a disqualification? Virtually identical sequences. Uh, and then you look at uh, Eddie Alvarez Dustin Poirier, the first fight they had with the illegal knee that, that resulted in the no contest. That there's that that was that was three different outcomes. I've just said for three almost identical fouls of the same nature of the need to a ground of the opponent, a no contest, a DQ, and a technical decision. We can't have, we can't have these kinds of rules up for, up for referee's discretion because they're codified. You know, they're, they're very specific about a, a, an illegal foul that ends a fight, et cetera, et cetera. That this, this, is, this is part of the rules. Like if I were approaching it from a legal perspective, uh, you know, the, the the model penal code style of, you know, purposefully, intentionally doing, committing a crime, uh, knowingly doing it. So knowing that I'm doing something that will result in something happening, recklessly going about doing something or being negligent about it. And I should have known that it would have happened. Those are all different, four different levels of, of, of that. All four of them can make you culpable for for your actions. And and to to not have a similar or even logically have a similar standard in MMA is just mind boggling because intent should not play a factor because intent implies that there are dirty Rob Schreiber's in the sport all over the place in, in or, or Gilbert Ivels. And what I mean by that are fighters that do intentionally foul their opponents to do something. There have been fighters like that in the nineties, you know, Gilbert Ivel bit somebody. He, he broke, a, didn't he break, um, didn't he break a cup? Didn't he break, who was it? it wasn't uh, in your ways, but it was in pride. There was a cup broken from a, yeah. from a kid. Yeah. yeah. And and then the fight continued later, but that's not the point. Intent should, should attach to your intent to throw the strike, not your intent to target the specific area, your intent to break the rules or something like that. That shouldn't play a factor because whether or not you intended to knee him when he was down, you need him when he was down, in the case of Boralio uh, Omar Gachiev, or in the case of Boudet Barnett. You very clearly el elbowed him in the back of the head. You wound up and drove down. This wasn't a case of, um, 
Frank Mir, Todd Duffy, where when Todd Duffy was spinning, part of Frank Mir's fist hit the back of Duffy's head. Okay. Well, that's entirely different because he was already throwing a punch and Duffy turned his head. Right. And th that was and it was legitimate and it was fine. It was an incidental strike and it was a, a, a knockout. This was nothing like that. And for this to be a technical decision where the foul landing fighter wins the fight by committing a clearly egregious act that ended the fight in one blow, and it wasn't a disqualification, is just, what are we doing then? What's the point of having the rule against these strikes if you enforce it in such a way that the person who throws the strike can still win the fight? It's just, it's beyond belief. And and even not even touching on the whole, the fact that uh, different jurisdictions, and you, you mentioned it, different jurisdictions about if you have the fingertips, if you have the palm, the fist, one hand, two hand, whatever that may be, is a nightmare. But this is Vegas, and it's pretty standard that fighters should know what the Vegas standard is. But it's they, it's all they get the talk. Yes, I mean you guys have and, all been backstage. You. They get mm -hmm. the talk. Yes, if you're not paying attention to that talk, or you're you know one of your cornermen is not translating it for you, that's on you. I've also, heard the talk. Yeah, yeah, the the rules vary from state to state, but this is this is Nevada. Yeah. His last fight was in that same fucking building. Yeah, this yeah. Is, like this if you is... don't know what the rule is in Nevada after two fights in a row there, that's on you. And the ignorance of the rules is no excuse. Is that Agreed. that's that's correct. And I and again, I need to just drill this in once more to reinforce this. These that's what fighters, she said. yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. Oosh. These fighters are directly informed of this prior to their fight. It is an obligation of the referee. The referee at the beginning of the fight says, You've already been given your instructions backstage. Why? Because they've already been given their instructions backstage. <laughs> so the referee is not only warning them ahead of time, they're warning them in the cage, Hey, don't forget those things I just told you. And then say, hey, don't do those things after I told you, don't, don't forget to do them. After before that, I told you, hey, don't do those things. Warnings, I don't want to get draconian, but there shouldn't be nearly as many warnings as the sport has. And, and then for these things, these technical decisions to happen, I really wish that something could happen where these fouls would be appealed but I know the Nevada State Athletic Commission. I know they're not going to touch this because they're going to say it's the referee's discretion. And Dan Mergliotta, you know, he's taken a lot of flack and deservedly so. But uh, it would be a big move if he stepped up, if these were appealed to say, yes, I, I should have applied it differently. It's it's just, it's it's a problem. And it shouldn't be a problem. These are black and white. It isn't a, it isn't a discretionary situation. And, and the fact that it is being left up to guesswork and not being sure of the rules and how to apply them, we should be way beyond that. Yeah, and the fact that it was Dan Mergliata in both cases, it's like, it makes me think one of two things. Either one, um, a gentleman who's normally very consistent and and is typically very good at his job, um, was he having just the worst professional day? Or is this just a fundamental misunderstanding of how to apply the rules. Um, I, I think that's an important question to ask when you have the same culprit. Like we can, you know, we pointed the finger at certain, like Kim Winslow, like we know she sucks or or Mazagati, like, okay, we know he's made some bad stoppages and Yamasaki and whatnot. When it's one person that's, that's doing this, um, I think it's important to look at that one person and see what exactly is the problem here. So, um, Perhaps some soul searching um, for Mergulata or uh, the athletic commission needs to pull him aside and see what's going on here. Uh, make sure he has a thorough understanding of what he's supposed to do out there. All right, gentlemen. So on to the next order of business. Um, we had um, an interesting shout out Saturday evening. Um, drug lords are, are are getting love on the UFC broadcast. Um, what do you think should come of um, forgive me for screwing up the pronunciation of this name because I'm bound to. Um, Munir Lazaz. That's close enough. Okay, good enough there. Well, in the immediate wake of it, like 
thank you, bless you, members of the MMA media who were in the media room and asked him to expound on this because uh, he started backpedaling like an NFL cornerback. Um, yeah, I mean, within about 45 to 60 seconds, it went from, yeah, he's great, to, oh, I didn't know about that. I ought to look it up, to, you know, this really isn't on topic. <laughs> so <laughs> he beat a hasty retreat. Um, I mean, it makes me uncomfortable whenever a fighter feels like they have to, like, kiss benefactor ass on the mic. It's just, ugh, you know, it's almost as bad as, like, begging Dana for 50000 bucks. I don't think anything should come from it. Like, what needed to come from it already came from it. Ask him to explain himself. He looks like a jackass. Uh, if some questioning by the authorities needs to come, since he was literally photographed in the company of a guy with a $5 million bounty on his head in Vegas during fight week, like, could you help us determine this gentleman's whereabouts? That might be appropriate, but that's kind of outside of my purview. Al Dawson, Alan Dawson, of um, I think it's, uh, this is Insider, uh, is, yeah, Insider is... Uh, just really did a spectacular job. That is journalism. I personally, I'm an editor for SureDog. I write news stories for SureDog amongst my many duties. I do not consider myself a journalist. At best, I'm a reporter, and I'm okay with that. I didn't. I don't intend to be a journalist. I don't intend to follow that kind of story. It's not in my purview. It's not in my. It's not part of my responsibilities and duties. I don't have time to do that too. And that breaks my heart, but it's just simply how it is. And I'm not trained as a journalist. I'm an attorney. That's a whole different set of skill sets that sometimes cross over, but I don't want to get there. Uh, but Alan Dawson pushing the issue was the right thing to do. Yep. Full stop. There's nothing wrong with any of the questions he asked or the fact that he pressed the issue for the next couple. Because these aren't minor little somethings. This is Munir Laze on the post-fight microphone taking the microphone back from Cormier after his interview was over to say, oh, by the way, I want to shout out my brother, Daniel Kinahan. This isn't, and, and then be like, oh, I didn't realize my multi-millionaire benefactor who I am very close with and have tons of pictures with. Well, I used to have tons of pictures with an Instagram, but I scrubbed I them all scrubbed them. for no reason. You know, obviously that they were all legitimate and good. I just deleted them. They, I don't know. It was a, it was a Sunday. I decided to delete a bunch of pictures from a, a known criminal that, that is wanted by the U S government. You are who you associate with to a degree. And to thank your brother, Daniel Kinahan, for all of your support and help and funding. Funding means money. Where does the money come from? Hello. It's not a big stretch here. And you can't make the connections directly because we don't have the evidence in front of us. But we can pontificate, we can speculate, and we can make logical conclusions drug lord pays me a whole bunch of money a disproportionate amount of money for what i'm worth as a eight and one fighter from tunisia you know this isn't a hot shot superstar this is a guy who fought on what brave i think it was a you may have brave or you UAE, UAE warriors U, yeah, UAE one of those warriors. two to, to get here to the you know this wasn't a a mega star and you're getting big dollar funding from a you know a, a, a family member of a criminal group it's Remember a couple weeks ago when I said that the UFC should behoove itself by taking these certain fighters and saying, you're associated with real problems and you're proud of your affiliation. Uh, Ramzan Kadyrov and Akhmat Fight Club was one such example in the, in the wake of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. To, to look at this and make a statement and draw a line in the sand, say, hey, you knowingly and intentionally associate, hey, we're going back to knowing intentional, um, associate with these particular people. You're paid by them to do the thing you do for us. We're going to take a break on you. Why would the UFC, in that same vein, cutting off somebody who is personally funded and financed by a, 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 an international crime lord, according to the U.S. government, not my words, um, maybe, maybe you want to pump the brakes on this. I know the UFC will do nothing. Uh, I hope the authorities give him some hard questions, at least, uh, because even if he himself specifically did nothing wrong 
and that he can't be intentionally or automatically guilty by association, there are some very, very interesting questions that he should answer. Well, the appearance is that he's being used for money laundering. Uh, there's a lot of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, good Lord. Like, why be such a dummy? Like, that that's the first question I have to ask. Like, because we've definitely... Um, stood on a particular moral platform on this show many, many times as the lines of decency repeatedly get get trampled in, in, in mixed martial arts. And I don't even want to do that right now because it's common sense that, hey, um, shall not a drug lord, eh, not a good look, bro. Like, just just not cool. And this is not the first time that uh, Canahan's name has has been part of the combat sports discussion. Like he is, he is a figure that has hovered over quite a bit um, in, in the in the the sports of fighting. The wanted photograph, the picture of Daniel Kinahan on the U.S. government's website is cropped from a picture with Darren Till. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So and, this this is a guy who's been around. And, and MMA is just where he's dipping his pinky toe. I mean, yeah, it's he's really in boxing. Fight month. Smokes. Yeah. yeah. We should have Matt Hunter on to talk about some of the stuff in boxing. Holy yeah, smokes. It, it, exactly. Like this, this is a guy. He'd be, who, tell, he'd be telling us that all property is theft anyway. So, yeah, yeah. Damn capitalists. Um, <laughs> I, you know, um, I, but where I want to draw attention on is the pure stupidity of, of the act because, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm, you know, I was some, some big dude in the street. Definitely was not. But I did know enough to know that. You keep your damn mouth shut. If you are associated with criminals and criminal activity, if you have information, if you if you've got anything in that in that sphere, shut your damn mouth. Do you want to keep this money rolling in that you have not earned um, <laughs> by the, the merits of your career? Or do you want to be a dummy and shout out the drug lord? that is giving you said money from the blood money that he makes. Which one sounds more appealing to you if it's because clearly we're not even going to talk about the, the, um, the level of risk associating with someone like that. So publicly like do, do you on that? Because clearly you don't have a moral problem with it, but maybe the, the little bit of intelligence that might be somewhere deep, deep, deep within the recesses of your brain says, man, I want to keep this money coming in. Maybe I'll just shut up instead of shouting out the guy who I got all over my Instagram and I'm taking all these pictures with him and I'm sitting here in in land that he is a wanted man on. Um, I mean, if if the FBI and Interpol and whoever else come knocking on your door asking you some questions that you can't answer without touching some bracelets yourself, you only got yourself to blame, dummy. Um, I mean, this is this is as bad as as all the rappers now you know, waving their illegal guns and all the videos and bragging about all the hits that they that that their homies have done on the song. Like this is this is that level of intelligence. Somebody writing down on a piece of paper. Yeah, like, it's okay, like, okay, all right, confirmed. All the cops got to do now is Confession. is watch your, your Instagram story, and they know everything. <laughs> you dummies. Good lord. Like what, what what like how stupid can you be? Like this is this is my big takeaway from that. This man is a dummy. And. There's a beautiful, beautiful moment at the, towards the end of the questioning from, from Alan Dawson that you could hear shouting from off on the side. And you might be able, you might have seen him look to the side several times. That was his team, his representatives say, stop, stop, stop. Don't answer any questions. This was the, all, the one step away from Laze saying, my attorneys have advised me not to answer your question. That's what that was. Yeah. And, 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 for them to say, no, stop, stop. He's like, no, I just believe in my fights. I, I only want to talk about my fights because obviously that's the only thing. You know, when I'm on jet, when I'm on, you know, $30 million jet boats with this guy, I don't ask where the money came from. I don't, I just drink the, the, the $7,000 bottle of champagne. Yeah, if if uh, if his people weren't off camera telling him to shut up, his the next thing he would have said was, oh, I can't wait to go to the after party and he's going to break a brick for me. Like that was going to be the, <laughs> the very next thing he'd say. Yep. So stupid. Self snitching. Why? I, I, I just don't get it. Um, There'll be a link to Ghetto Boys G code in the comments <laughs> or, you know, in the summary of this uh, of this episode of the Living Death Show. 
Good Lord. What what a, a parade of idiots that we have to report on every week. Good Lord. Um, all right. On to on to other things. Uh, more failure, you're saying. <laughs> Bellator 277 uh, hey. also took place Friday. Um you know, before we because because Jay, the way the way you've put this in in our our show outline perfectly framed, but I want to I want to deviate a little please, bit. Please, please. Yeah. So so here we go. It says is what happened at Bellator two seventy seven the worst case scenario for the organization with McKee losing and the two hundred five pound final going to a no contest. Before we jump into that, whether this event was a failure, what did you guys think of the decision between AJ McKee and Pitbull? 48, 47, Pitbull, one, two, and three. I scored for Pitbull. Same. Okay. I had it. I had it. Uh, but I'm not opposed mm-hmm. to your score if you had it for McKee. I had it for McKee, but about this, like 48, 47, like I'm, I, I like just about all the events. Um, lately, I didn't get to watch this live, so I, I watched it after the fact, and I did see the, the stream of, of comments on every form of social media that that i'm a part of in in the mixed martial arts world and they were all like this is the biggest robbery i've ever seen and i didn't quite see it that way like i will say that i thought it was no question that mckee won i thought that was pretty clear cut but i wouldn't say it's a robbery necessarily i think um i think we had a i think pitbull had he had some moments in 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 rounds that that may not have been much activity in and that's what swayed the judges i think he showed himself to be the better fighter overall um and deserved the win but i'm not too mad because i think he lost because of things that he didn't do in, in the right moment so um so so gentlemen what, what was your assessment of the actual action that took place between those two go ahead Dobby. I it wasn't an unmitigated disaster. I mean, for one thing, it's not as though Bellator dropped the ball here. These were both the logical matchups to make. And in the case of the light heavyweights, it was the only matchup to make because it was a tournament final. The featherweight title rematch was, I think, a logical conclusion at this point. I'm not a big fan of immediate title rematches, but here you're talking about probably the most dominant fighter in Bellator history and not a whole lot else you could do with the new champ. So both matchups made sense. And if you make the right matchups, then what shakes out shakes out. This is a chaotic sport. You can't script it. It's not professional wrestling. Um, McKee losing, obviously, that's a little bit of a blow from a marketing standpoint because while these are two of the top fighters in the world, they're two pound-for-pound talents, McKee had the additional shine of being the young phenom who had blown through everything in his path. That zero really, really counts for a lot. Think of how differently we think of Khabib Nurmagomedov and Alex Volkanovsky because one guy has a zero and one guy has a one, even though for the relevant parts of their careers, they're virtually, it's virtually the same career track. You know, labor and anonymity hit your prime in your early 30s, you know. So it's a little bit of a blow from that standpoint, but at the same time, now they can make a trilogy fight. Now, and that's an actual rubber match. If McKee had beaten Pitbull again, whether he blew through him in 90 seconds again, or it was this same fight, but he won the decision, what are they going to do with McKee next? Because they have nothing to offer him at featherweight. The only guy of any interest is his lifelong best friend. Like, even if they aren't teammates anymore, these are guys that like went to high school together and hung out. Like, what are they going to do? Like give him like Pedro Carvalho or something like at least this gives them something to do with their featherweight title in the next six months, aside from just like cringe and wait for McKee to get bored or, you know, wait for, you know, who to, to get ready to, to off, you know, break out the checkbook for him. This helps them from that standpoint. And the 205 pound final, obviously a no contest is never any fun. And this is a legitimate no contest. Like this, you know, was fight ending and it was nobody's fault. No contest. Uh, but that one, I'm. it's probably going to get remade as well. It's still the logical fight to make. Anderson is still the most deserving challenger. So, yeah, we just, we get a little bit of blue balls while we wait for a man's cut to heal and, and we redo these fights. And the, the best thing about blue balls is that when it's relieved, oh, oh. what a magical moment. 
Yes. Absolutely magical. Have you guys seen a Corey Anderson fight, though? It's not as if it's going to be a, a bang, bang, Johnny Walker kind of knockout like he did to Johnny Walker. It, this, this was a disaster, I, I, I believe. I'm a little more harsh, and I'm harsh towards Bellator, not because they could control anything that happened in there, but they could have controlled a little something in there. I didn't believe that A.J. McKee should have fought Patricio Pierre uh, immediately for the rematch. I, I didn't see that Pitbull had the run at featherweight that merited an immediate rematch. Like, uh, Ioana getting knocked out by Rose Namiudis and go, okay, maybe this was AJ McKee kicking him upside the head and then hitting him with a guillotine choke that almost put him out. And there was a possibly early technical, technical submission that was more of a, a merciful one than it was maybe a legitimate stoppage. Not enough to be like, man, I have to see this again because clearly Pitbull was wrong. And this puts them in such a bad situation because they, and I'm going to piggyback off something. God, I wish I knew, I should have written it down. Who said this on Twitter? It was one of our friends in the media that said that Bellator has never been able to put Patricio Freire over. They've never been able to sell him or draw big numbers with him, even as a two division champion. They've never been able to market this guy worth a flip. And I don't think him beating the one guy they could possibly market as the shining star, the unbeaten kid, the whole, the whole everything, the, the, the kitten caboodle, and it's gone because we know how deflating a record, an undefeated record is versus a, I have a loss on my record because I think we were talking about this, that, yeah, I mean, Volkanovsky were 20 something and Oh, he'd be being discussed as, He'd already probably be in discussion for the greatest featherweight ever, even though that loss happened at welterweight. That's the kind of effect an, or a loss in your career has. And so even though he lost to Bellator's best fighter, I mean, Patricio Pitbull is leagues by 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 far their best fighter uh, just by this metric beating McKee and by his body of work of winning 21 fights in the Bellator banner. That's that's wild. That's more than anybody. He's a, He's Mr. Bellator. And now they can't have, I would agree with what Duffy said, were it not for McKee saying, I'm done at featherweight. And if he wants to fight me again, he can come fight me at 155. Well, record scratch moment, his brother's the champion at 155, whom he gave up his lightweight title so his brother could fight for. So there's not at all a possibility that Pitbull's going back up to 155 with Pitbull already the champion. Yes, they well, and, the until champion. McKee moves up and dusts him. Mm -hmm. Until McKee moves up and dusts him, that's the only possible thing they have. And of course, the no contest is just a, a horrible circumstances. There were some really bad takes on this, though. You know the worst takes I saw? Why didn't the, the, this were takes on the internet uh, from from people I respect? Why didn't Frank Trigg just let time expire and let the third round end to check on the cut? No. Timeout. That's not how this works. A fight ending blow. A, it, a clash of heads, an inter, in, accidental headbutt, whatever you want to call it, a headbutt opened up a cut like that that immediately merited stopping the fight. It was a not quite as bad as Marvin Eastman, but we're getting there kind of cut. Why would you then go, hey, keep going, guys. You're good. We'll we'll let this time out so that we can go to a technical decision. That's so that's so what? Well, that's why Alistair Overeem beat Jairzinho Rosenstrike 49 46 that yes, night. Yes, that's exactly right. That that thing on his face for, of, of over his face was nothing. Yeah, yeah they just let it go the extra five seconds and you know, like Overeem won. Like it could have been really bad if they'd yeah. stopped it. I think this was <laughs> this, however, to, to end what I'm saying here, this was a really bad circumstance for Bellator because even though there's Nemkov still retains the title no contest and they run it back they can run it back and have the big rematch well not really because Anderson was winning it'd be like if they ran back um I mean they're going to run back Congo Bader with the eye poke in the first round but honestly it'd be like running back Muhammad versus uh Leon Edwards it was an early second round eye poke, but Edwards won the first round handily and was showing no signs of slowing down. So you already know how it's going to play out based on what you've seen. We already know that Corey Anderson was able to do what nobody had really been able to do to Nemkov. So we're looking at this going, okay, they're going to fight in three months. 
There's nothing Nemkov is going to be able to do from a wrestling perspective to shore up the deficiencies that Corey Anderson exploited. Why? Because that's what Corey Anderson does. So we've kind of, the, 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 the track has already been laid for how it's going to play out. And I think that's why this hurts Bellator, because we saw enough of the fight where we know how it would play out again, because that's the kind of thing that Corey Anderson is so good at doing. And we have no result because of the no contest. So that I, I, I this was this was a really rough. The only shining moment they have, even though Petrigio Pitbull is their greatest fighter, is that Aaron Pico is dangerous, and and that's that's a big selling point for them. Uh, you know what, uh, Jay? I'm I'm going to have to disagree with you big time. Please go on, ahead on the quality of Bellator 277. I think I think this actually didn't turn out that bad for them. AJ McKee, um, for one is still a huge name in the sport, a huge name for the company, and still arguably their best fighter. Uh, he was making a lot of noise leading up to this this bout about how he was going to be the UFC champion. Um, we know f- for sure that, that Dana White and Hunter and everyone who has a say-so in that building in Vegas is watching McKee and waiting to see when they can swoop in with with the uh, wide open arms and a checkbook uh, to to lure him over there. And we're almost certain that he's going to take that bait when when the time comes. That at least was delayed a little bit. So Bellator gets to keep him a bit longer. They at least have one more big fight from him, and that's going to be the rubber match against, uh, against Patricio. Not to mention the idea that he can go for revenge against his brother Patricio. Um, if if he if he so desires, so you keep him around for that, um, and the fight itself was very entertaining in, in, in my opinion. You also have the the close decision loss um, could be a great selling point to maintain this this aura of invincibility that that preceded McKee uh, in this fight. Like you can have that still because hey, a lot of people say he really didn't lose. That could be another selling point. Uh, as far as Corey Anderson and Nemkov is concerned, that was another fight that I found to be very entertaining, and we could see that again. Um, and while while we you, we can't say, you know, you're saying you're not necessarily waiting to see that happen all over again, well, we've got Velasquez versus Carbush as the next main event. We've got Cyborg rematching Blenko in the most undeserved title rematch of all time coming up um, after that. So it's not like we have this this lineup of blockbuster main True. events that this is going to be in, in shoehorned into and oh man this really throws off the flow of this this great content we got coming because <laughs> the next few things probably are really going to suck. There, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not I can't at all disagree with you. Um, if I could throw in one last thing, stats don't matter, first of all, second of all, and third of all. When it comes to an in-fight, how do you score it and whatever, like like striking totals and whatever, because McKee outlanded uh, Pitbull by a fairly significant margin. Obviously, that didn't matter because other because moments, like you said at the very beginning, the moments he had, the big, the almost knockdown, the guillotine, those kind of big, significant moments. But there's my biggest, the biggest, biggest, biggest takeaway I had was the week before the fight, McKee was talking about challenging, and Coker, Scott Coker, Bellator president, was talking about having his champions go over and whoop up on the UFC champions. And this fight in particular turned me from that would be an interesting fight to that would be horrible. In Alexander Volkanovsky's fight against Korean Zombie at DOC 273 the week before, by himself, he landed almost as many strikes in four, three rounds and 45 seconds as McKee and Pitbull did in their five round fight with that, with the same amount of takedowns. Alexander Volkanovsky, I don't want to go so far to say he could beat them both on one night, but he would destroy either of them in such a fashion that I am not interested in seeing AJ McKee fight. Uh, Volkanovski, unless he won several times in the UFC to get there, this this shocked me to a level where I went. They're not on the same level here because what Volkanovski has been doing is phenomenal. These guys were spent after three or change rounds, and Volkanovski by himself again to reiterate what I said had done their combined output in three and change rounds, and he wasn't tired. 
So he would be able to do anything he wanted to these guys because I, I, I'm just shocked at how that turned out. You know, I, I think, Jay, I got to use your words against you on this one because I think those stats don't really show the full picture. Um, mm -hmm. my, biggest, um, my biggest problem with McKee in this fight was – was the fact that he tried to swing for the fences with every single strike. He did. And that gets you tired very, very fast. It wasn't until later on that he started throwing more pity pat shots. And I think that was just uh that was just the fatigue catching up to him. Yeah. But like and and I almost uh, do you remember when Stefan Bonner um I think he, uh, when he fought Mark Coleman, he ended up losing that fight. Yeah. And and he said he said afterward that he had a dream that the fight was going to finish by a spinning back kick to the body. And and he and he was so sold on that idea that he kept trying to set it up yep. that, that whole fight. And that's how he feels like he lost. I think I think AJ McKee had that same dream. Um, because it was it was like this, he was just weirdly married to to that spinning back kick and he's he throwing wanted to it and he's knock throwing him it. out. Yeah, he wanted he wanted to make a statement as yes. opposed to wanting to win the fight. He didn't want to just win the fight until well past the midpoint. When he realized, okay, I'm not going to just knock this guy out of here, um, you know, with with the the flick of the wrist. Like I need to actually beat him over time. And by then, you know, by by then he's already shown too many flaws in the armor. He's he's worn down. I I, I think if you put a McKee versus the the top of the division at, at featherweight in the UFC. We're we're on serious style versus style territory. We're on serious styles makes make fight discussions more than anything else. Where Volkanovski prevails, I think would be would be the methodical approach. Would be more so the strategy he's going to take into it. Um, it so I, I still think I still think there's a lot uh, there's a lot of rich territory there if you did have the the champion versus champion discussions. Um, with the UFC's featherweight division, I think you you have a lot of discussion there, um, and I'm really curious to see what McKee is going to look like next go around, because this was this was not the same laser focused, the 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 same deadly McKee that we that we saw leading up to his title win. This was this was him perhaps feeling himself a little bit too much. This was this was him thinking past his opponent. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what those, those lessons are going to look like for him in the future. So just had to throw that in there. I like it. Yeah. So, um, so I'm, I'm still down for, for the, for the champions versus champions fights. I'm still down for that. All right. Um, okay, gentlemen, let me go ahead and get the clock ready to go. I had an idea. If oh, you what's will, up, man? To, to uh, we, because we have the quick hits questions, but I think I have better ones, or at least more appropriate ones, given the discussions we have. Could I, could I lead the dance on these, and you uh, can absolutely. run the clock? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um. Yeah. Just uh. Just because I have not seen everything from all the events over the I last. I will. I won't. So. I won't. I know. I know what you know. I got you. <laughs> all right. All right. Let uh, me go ahead and get the volume up on the clock. We're gonna start with Ben. And I, 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 I think you, your, your, uh, yeah, your input is going to be well received in this. Question is, uh, was Antonio McKee's advice to AJ that he was up every round the worst possible corner advice he could have given his son? Yes, pretty much. But by the time he was saying that, the damage had already been done. I'm completely with Ant in that. McKee went into this fight just looking for the knockout, thinking he was going to be able to blow through Pitbull again. And it was a stark contrast from the guy on the way up who had just taken whatever his opponents gave him and used it to his best advantage just so smoothly and so effortlessly. So by the time McKee, like older McKee was giving that bad advice, I can't think of better advice he could have given him except maybe go back to trying to knock him out with one punch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and you you know the the Aaron Pico fight, so you you're good on that one. So yeah. my question to you is: uh, so AJ McKee has graduated from prospect to champion to challenger status. Is Aaron Pico the most exciting prospect on Bellator's roster right now? Ding. 
Um, you'd have to give me uh, time to figure out who's the best prospect on the Bellator roster right now because it's not Aaron Pico simply because he is no longer a prospect. This man has fought way too much. He's fought two high level of opponents, uh, and whether he's not, you know, gotten the win column every time, so be it. This man has been way too experienced to be considered a prospect at this time. Um, so yeah, I I think it's time for that big step up all over again, man. Nice respect of the clock. I like it. Oh, yeah. um, I, I I suppose I'll I'll have my question. It won't be about Bellator. Uh, it'll be about the UFC card because I don't have a good third topic about Bellator. Uh, so my question will be: uh, Can Pani Kianzad, who just won over Lena Landsberg, emerge as a contender at 135? She she has the style to frustrate because she's an effective striker. At range, she's strong enough to not be sucked into most clinch exchanges. But then Raquel Pennington tossed her around in her last fight. So how far can we go if that's the case? I think she can emerge as a contender, but a challenger, only if she gets the right set of opponents. Once she gets up to Holly Holm, she'll have the, the knockback down thing. And, right. and my question to everybody, this is the one where you can have everybody gets the time. Um, this week there was some news that announced there were two retirements that, that came out. UFC Bantamweight Mar- and former title challenger Marlon Marias hung up his gloves. And at the end of Ryzen 35, Shoshi Kusaka, 52 years young, also retired. So my question is, uh, it's you can take this any way you want and, and, and how you want to approach it. Which, which retirement you felt is bigger or, or, or more important? And you can have this one first. Marias or Kasaka? Um, I'll go Marias simply because he's younger. Um, I don't think either retirement is going to be that impactful necessarily with no disrespect to either of their legacies. We're talking about a 52-year-old who clearly is not uh, is, is not going to stay in the sport much longer. And we're talking about a guy uh, in Marias whose chin is grossly depleted and his, his better days are far behind him. So I, I don't think this is really going to have much of an impact, but they both left Good, good enough legacies. Ben, following on that kind of that avenue of it, when it comes to like legacies of these two guys, which 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 fighter had more of a lasting legacy for you, Marlon Marias or Shiyoshi Kasaka? Marlon Marias, and I say that to someone I was there as a spectator and a fan for most of the high points of Shiyoshi Kasaka's career, but his greatest win quote unquote wouldn't even be a win by modern MMA standards. You know what I mean? Like an inadvertent cut, you know, to yeah, exactly. Like Marlon Marais was actually one of the best fighters in his world in the world of his weight class of his era. Yeah. Like it's Marais. You can hit the go button. All right. Uh, yeah, I I I too I I, I, I will admit, I didn't really discover the full depth of rings for like before like a decade ago because I always I always knew it as like a MMA fighters can do pro wrestling but kind of hit each other. That's kind of my always impression of, of rings. So I didn't really hold it in high regard. So my knowledge of Kasaka is some of his UFC fights, his pride appearances, maybe a pancreas or two, and, and of course his later career. Meanwhile, Marias has just done so much more, I think. So I, I I feel like in that regard I I got to go Marias. All right. Okay. Well, I mean one sad part about um just at least the combination of us three not getting together for the last couple of weeks um is that we couldn't share what surprised us in perhaps the best titled segment in all of media history. I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons, where we share something that surprised us or ironically did not since we last met. Um. So since there was a show last week, shout out to to the homie Pat OJ for, for filling in for me. Um, we're just going to go from the last time the show took place since uh, I, I was not present. Ben, you're up first. What's your I'm not surprised Mr. Falcons moment this week? Uh, I was a little surprised in at UFC Vegas 51 on Saturday when after, uh, you know, a signal win 
uh, for Drakkar Close in his first fight back in over a year after the infamous shove uh, incident. He gives a fiery and foul mouth call out of Mark O. Madsen, of all people. Like, I, I had never <laughs> known that a Danish person could garner so much hate from somebody. Like, Denmark is the home of, like, Legos and chocolates. And, like, why were you so mad? And then he explained it afterwards. And it's that he hates Eric Albarasin. So mm-hmm. I was surprised. And then I wasn't surprised. Like, those, those big white frame glasses just... You know, it's like waving a bull in front of, or a, a red cape in front of a bull. It's like rage, uh, you know, results, and and people have no no choice but to charge. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is a beautiful one, uh, Jay. Um, I'm going to put 60 seconds on the clock for you. Thank you. Please share your I'm not surprised, Mr. Falcons moment this week. I could go on for days, so thank you for doing this. Uh, On Friday, if you follow me on Twitter, you might know what I was doing on Good Friday. I was doing a thing on Good Friday. Uh, Every year on Good Friday in a town in Guatemala, uh, they hold something called Chivaretto. I'm sure I'm butchering the actual Latin pronunciation of it. Where it is where they erect a boxing ring in the center of town and just say, do you want to fight somebody? Come on up. No, no gloves, no training, no fight clothing. Like there were guys in blue jeans and sandals and and polo shirts and button downs, just throwing down. And there's a special boxing. If you get knocked down, the fight's over. It's like a short timer or whatever. And it was spectacular to watch. But there was one referee who's like 6'4". His name is Jerry. He's from Sacramento. I would like to interview him for sure, dog. Jerry, hit me up. Um, Where he was the referee and he got up there and he fought. 13 people and he beat 13 people and my heart and my everything belonged to Jerry that day because what a rock star everybody wanted to fight him and the women wanted to well they wanted to slap him actually that's a whole different thing (laughs) it was magical Oh, yes. Very nice. I mean, so, I assume that Full Metal Dojo was just watching this and going, why didn't we think of this shit? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll 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 up it. They'll um they'll yeah. come up with something even more fantastic. All right. So um, my, I'm not surprised. Mr. Falcon's moment I actually just I, I totally forgot about this because I was going to go in a totally different direction. But um, Jake Paul is back on the call out circuit and he has targeted the former UFC middleweight champion, Michael Bisping. Seriously? As a potential opponent, yes. And not surprisingly, Michael Bisping has responded with a smile saying, send the contract. Um, We are boxing 40-plus-year-old one-eyed dudes now. So the the Jake Paul train continues going. Um, Man, this this man knows how to promote. I'm not mad. He went straight for the eyes, too. Like in one of his tweets, he was like, I'm going to use that side eye emoji since you can't use it. Oh, <laughs> like no. just going straight for it. It's terrible. I'm just laughing because it's so inappropriate. <laughs> horrible and so comical at the same time. All right. That's a good um, segment right there. Yeah. That, I'm, I'm I not did mad not at that know at he all. was doing that. <laughs> all right, gentlemen. So we do have the start of 2022's PFL season in a couple days, actually, Wednesday. Yeah. Lightweights and heavyweights are up first. We're looking right now at the the names that are listed here. Who stands out as potential dark horses in these divisions, and who do you expect to win when it's all said and done? In in the lightweight division, I think my actual dark horse is defending champ House Mountfield. Uh, I still think Natan Schulte is the probably the best overall fighter, or in the best competitive shape right now i mean anthony pettis is there but he's not anthony pettis anymore uh i think like natan schulte is my uh is my front runner to win this thing back that, that he once owned like that he twice owned uh but house monfield very live dog there uh he would be my dark horse on the light heavyweight tip uh cardi zapato is my front runner again i i think again he is the best overall fighter there he's a guy that by all rights, should still be in the UFC and was like a borderline top 15 guy there. Like, he's not a bad fighter at all. He's a very good fighter. He's physically in his prime. Uh, he like He's my front runner, and I would say kind of my dark horse would be like maybe uh, Emiliano Sordi. 
or even Omari Akhmadov. What about you, Jay? Those are those are pretty similar to mine. I, I, I look at lightweight and I see the division, I see the style matchups. And I just I look at Natan Schultz against most of these guys. I think he would make their lives miserable. The only guy that's beaten him recently uh, was Marcin Held, who just so happens to be the nastiest leg locker west of the Pecos. You know, it's like just a guy who he'll just you'd be walking down the street and he'll lay a heel hook on you. Just that kind of danger. <laughs> so Natan Schultz had to deal with that for three rounds. And that's why he lost the decision. Uh, he didn't get tapped or anything like that. But I don't see anybody at lightweight that poses that kind of threat. Like Collard's got good hands. Pettis is good. You know, Pettis and Stevens are the, the cast off crew. Uh, Olivier or Mercier is kind of a, a well rounded, but I'm not feeling maybe a dark horse kind of thing. Uh, Hush Manfio, I like him a lot. He, she, he taught me a lot, but I feel like he kind of snaked his way up the division to, to get the best. I mean, he didn't do it, it wasn't his fault. Uh, but to get, he got some great matchups in. Um, Oh, geez, uh, Hoylton, uh, Peregrino, and then Anthony Pettis. And he barely got by them to get in the playoffs. And then he kind of worked over Clay Collard. And then he, for the for the finals, he got the ultimate bridesmaid of PFL in uh, Jaguar Paw, uh, Rajabov, who can't seem to close. He's that, I'm going to get to the top. He's the, the Kenny Florian of PFL, who just keeps getting to the top and just can't make it. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to go... With with Schultz as my front runner, um, yeah, probably OAM as my dark horse, just to kind of be the frustrating kit two decisions and and get there. Uh, and at light heavyweight, man, Shoeface is just he's such a dangerous opportunist that makes him a threat to every single guy there. Like every one you look at and be like, well, I could see Akmeno leaving his head out a little too long, getting choked. I could see Robert Wilkinson getting a little overzealous and tying him up in the clinch and then shoe face pulling guard and hitting on something. I can just see that happening. So I feel like he, unless he gets clipped by something crazy, I just see him as the top guy. Uh, I don't want to pick the same as, as you. Uh, I think that Martin, Martin Hamlet, who was the runner up last year uh, is strong enough to resist some of the more grueling situations like Akhmedov, who will want to toss you around, uh, Sorty, who will want to pressure you back up to the wall and mess you up. Uh, I, I, I see Hamlet probably getting close. Uh, I don't know if he can get past you face. I think if if Hamlet goes all the way, it's because he didn't have to fight Anthony Antonio Carlos Jr., yeah, I, I think um, good assessment. I'm not even going to try to reinvent the wheel. I mean, uh, the tennis show, like, I think is the front runner uh, at, at lightweight. Um, as much as I'd love to see Clay Collard shock the world because he's just a fun guy to have around and he's such a, a monkey wrench in any contest that he finds himself in, that would be beautiful. But I, the time is just, he's just so solid and so consistent. It's really hard, especially in a tournament format, to get past a guy like that, a guy who fights like that. Um, as far as light heavyweight is concerned, I, I'm 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 with you, Ben. Shoeface is is the guy I'm I'm looking to the most. So um, yeah, there, there we go. Um, we are really lucky. Just sort of a really quick aside, we are lucky because the first fight of 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 the well, the very first fight, but the first fight in the first round is Clay Collard versus Jeremy Stevens. Yeah, like oh, yeah. that's. Oh, that's yeah. what that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you, matchmakers. You did that one good one. And little do little uh, does the audience know that we actually were sent advanced copies of the fight that was pre-recorded two months ago. So it's not um, like we're picking <laughs> shoe face for a good reason or anything. Yeah, it's not like we have any insider knowledge of the previous <laughs> tapings. So, you know, in fact, I heard they use the same sound stage as one, but that's another story. It's too bad that Josh Silvera is out of the contest because. <laughs> He oh, would have won last week. <laughs> All right, fellas. So Bellator is, is back at it. Um, this, I think, are they on Saturday? Friday and Saturday, dude. Friday, Friday and Saturday, Saturday double header. Oh, that's Hawaii right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So that's, I'm, I'm more confused here. So Friday and Saturday, we've got Bellator. Um, Liz Carmouche and and um, Velasquez in the main event for the title. Cyborg, Arlene Blanco for a, a rematch uh title as well either one of these fights getting you uh get a little movement going on in the in, in the old boxer shorts there 
No, no. I mean, and the funny thing is, reverse, like, no, 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 there is no, no, nothing moved. Yeah, nothing well, moved. It, perhaps I, I, I should have framed that better. This is not because they're female fighters, just just excitement level for the fight in the, the uh, crudest way possible, I could say. In an inversion of the typical Bellator formula, these are cards packed with really good stuff and the main events are the worst thing about them. And I'm not faulting Bellator. They they, they put together the logical title. Well, the, the Borg versus Blanco rematch is pretty rough, but uh, Carmouche versus Velasquez is the obvious logical next flyweight title fight. It just doesn't have a whole lot of sizzle. Obviously, Borg versus Blanco, too. We have a very good idea how that's going to turn out. But, hey, that's what they need to do to, you know, get their cards over there to Hawaii. The rest of the cards are fantastic. Like, lots of good stuff. Jay, what say you? I I really feel for Arlene Blanco because she's going to end up with the record for title losses at, at this stage. I mean, she had the... The, the rough one to Julia Budd that, you know, couldn't, I don't, I, it wasn't as close as, as they, the, the media had it. I thought, I, I thought that Bud won three to two pretty fairly, um, but Blanco had her moments, but you know what? She didn't have any moments against Cyborg and it's not going to be better after knocking out what Diana Silva and, and, and getting by Pam Sorensen. I was high on Pam Sorensen going over to Bellator. I thought she'd be a fresh, fresh name. Uh, she's strong. She's got good fundamentals. I thought she'd be able to to make waves, and then she got beaten by the ultimate Joe Benavidez of women's 145 for for Bellator in Arlene Blenko, who was just good enough to beat everybody. Basically, not named Cyborg, Julia Budd, or um, uh, Marlos Conan. I think she she got tapped by Conan. Uh, I'm going to go with the upset of Liz Carmouche getting the title if she doesn't fight a fight like she did when she fought uh, Valentina Shevchenko and just kind of doesn't do anything, I think that she can put Velasquez on her back or at least make her think about putting her on her back enough to to win uh, maybe three or four rounds probably there and get the title. Uh, but Blanco, it'll be interesting once she gets, if she gets out of the first round this time, because I don't think she will. Yeah, I'd be highly, highly surprised if uh, if the the ring car girls are even necessary um, after the 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 opening frame. Um, you know, I I think Ben, I think you're right. There there are some some good fights on this card. There are definitely some some names that strike up some interest, like you know Weber Almeida. I think he's a fun guy to watch. Eric Perez, um, uh, Yancy Medeiros is 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 on. I think the Saturday card. So it, it's some it's it's some good names and some interesting matchups, but this is the problem with the the two fights back to back is that you're diluting the product. Yes. Um, and I understand like going to Hawaii is a different monster as far as you know the the cost of getting the equipment there and um, setting up and it, that it it becomes such a, a gargantuan task that yeah they they put on two events to kind of justify it so you get double the gate. But man, if if you condense both of these cards um, halfway and then combine them, man, yeah. you've got some solid really? stuff. Yes, that you've is, got some solid stuff. That is an excellent point. Yeah, so that that's really my only issue with this. But uh, I mean, we'll 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 have a couple of good bangers here. Um, Horiguchi definitely gonna crowd the weekend. Yeah, Horiguchi versus Patchy Mix. That's oh, gonna yeah. be awesome. Yes, please sign me all the way up for that. Uh, Archuleta fighting too. Like, I'm Holland always down for an Archuleta fight. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, so what what's wrong, man? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right go to Hawaii. Yep. I mean, Hawaii is a nice place. I mean, I got married there. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah, you did you you weren't there. You weren't born yet. So all right. Um <laughs> let's let's move things on um to our final topic. Um UFC Fight Night two oh five, aka UFC Vegas fifty two. Amanda Lemos and Jessica Andrade, a strawweight headliner. Is there anything else that's jumping off at this page for you? What what other fights on this card are you looking forward to, if anything? I'm I'm jumping off. I I'm I'm jumping off the roof of my house. Like, <laughs> I mean, we just got finished with UFC on ESPN 34, which my 
co-host Adam on the recap and I both gave it an F, which is very rare. Wow. Like worst worst yet. UFC card of the year. It was bad on paper and it ended up disappointing even in comparison to those modest standards. And this one, there is nobody on the entire undercard who's above 500 in the UFC. Ouch. Yeah. Full stop. That's, that's it. Yeah. There's nobody on the undercard that's above 500 in the UFC. It's a, it like it's it's I know I know from like personal standpoints I know there are there are certain names that we like oh we're gonna pay attention to like Mike Jackson yeah opening the card friend First of the fight. show we've had him on a, a few yeah. times um I know you're you're friends with Ike Villanueva minus minus fifteen hundred oh my goodness on the Mike Jackson fight like minus six hundred on the Tyson Pedro Ike Villanueva fight. Like I do like Ike Villanueva, and you know I would I'll say what I, you know, would would say to his face. You know, like he he was only ever a borderline UFC level guy at, at best. You know he really did benefit from the COVID era and just being there and being willing to step up. But he, he's one in four in the UFC. Like in any other era, he would have been cut long ago. And he's a huge underdog to a guy in Tyson Pedro that hasn't even fought in three years. Like I get, the, I get that Dean Barry has some hype, but his last win was against a guy that was six and thirty. Like, oh, no, like Jackson versus Barry is kind of interesting because yeah, Bar Barry's gonna want to strike with him. Like Tyson Pedro, he's got that like I'm a wild Australian dude kind of vibe. <laughs> he's a grappler. Oh yeah, he's, he's gonna, gonna, he's gonna try to take Ike down and tap him out. Yeah. Like I'm interested to see Dean Barry trying to knock out Mike Jackson because Jackson is slick on the feet. It's what he's got. Like his setbacks have all come on the ground and he's actually undefeated across like boxing, kickboxing and Muay Thai, you know, in, in the smattering of appearances he's had. And speaking yeah. of, speaking of undefeated and to cut you off the, I am pumped for the main event in a way I shouldn't. It, okay. It's like a show and fraud kind of pumped. Like I'm, 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 I'm excited for what the heck is going to go wrong in this fight. And it's going to be so much fun. Alexander Romanov is 15 and Oh, and he's still suplexing dudes and looking cool doing it. And uh, he's fighting Tanner Bozer, a mullet, giant mullet. Well, it's not giant. It's like 6'2", so he's a little bit taller than me. Like an inch I thought you were saying his stuff. mullet was giant. Like his, mullet, big. his mullet is a beast. Um, and I, I, I like Tanner Bozer, but I, I'm really curious to see if, if Romanov, what happens when he gets his hands on him, if he can make him go fly, because that's going to be fun. Uh, what what? I'll probably make a joke in the play by play. What happens if King Kong gets his hands on a bulldozer? We're about to find out. Yeah, I think um I mean kind of like the uh the Bellator cards. Um I, I see individual names that are like, okay, that like we got Lando Fanata fighting. You know, he's always fun to watch. Uh Manel Cape is fighting. Like there there are some good there's some good names on here that are that are probably gonna pack some action. And I, I have a feeling that this will be one of those cards that afterward Dana's gonna be at the podium like, see, this is why you watch yeah. the fights. Yeah. Um, of course, that doesn't speak to the quality of the fight card, just you know, the the way the action played out, which is obviously something we can't know as we we walk in um before it takes place. So I mean it's not PFL, it's not tape delayed. Yeah. Or kombach. Linda Venata, Charles Jordan is the obvious, most obvious of obvious fight of the nights that you can have. So at least there's that. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if you don't have anything else going on Saturday that, night. That is an excellent, excellent way to advertise this card. Yeah. You're not like, doing anything else. Yeah. I mean, like this Bellator. this is probably one that, I don't know, we'll we'll see what the kids are doing. If, they're, if they'll let me watch it live. Probably not. They never do. So mm. Well, you'll also have to fight against Bellator because because uh cyborg is going to do bad things but you got one archer letter ruffian stop so they're kind of programmed because that's cool yeah but I, I don't think this is the the week that i'm going to burn that free trial for showtime just yet um although i could spread that out over my my several streaming services like i could do it on youtube tv then do it on hulu and then whatever else i, I know i got another one that i can i can do that on so we'll we'll, we'll, we'll see all right, gentlemen, I think that's going to do it for this edition of the Living Death Show. Big shout out to Jay and Ben, as always, doing the damn thing. Much appreciate your your kindness, patience, and and love uh, for the Walkout Network and the sport of mixed martial arts. You can find them on SureDog.com. 
Um, so there will be uh, pre and post fight coverage from both gentlemen. Um, Jay, you on play by play again? I'm assuming heck, for something. Yeah. Uh, for PFL and for UFC, this is going to be a hard week. And yeah. there's KSW happening this week. People forgot. That's right. Forgot about KSW. Yeah. So yeah, this is a busy, busy week. So we will have a lot to talk about next week. Um, remember to like, subscribe, share, tell a friend to tell a friend, tell that friend to tell 10 more friends. Stay beautiful. Stay positive. Don't feed your two-year-old Captain Crunch if you want a peaceful household. And stay sexy. I'll see you when I see you. Peace. Wow, 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 wow